Hi, Danny. How are you, my dear? Danny, I, I am beyond honored to be able to talk to you. How are you doing in Florida? Well, uh, yeah, getting away from it all. It's nice to be in here. You know, well, this is going on, obviously. You know, it's a good place to be, to sit it out. But, uh, yeah, that's good. And so, it's quiet around here. I can do a bit of writing. You know, we're happy here. Do you do you still you still actively write and play? Yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, you got to, haven't you? That's what you do. But uh, we haven't been able to. I've been off the road, obviously. But um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of solo stuff. I got a band, Wint Moody Wing Band, they call it. And um, I know I a, a good friend of mine, Alex, is in your band. Oh, of course, yeah, of course. Yes. I love, I Alex. love Alex. I interviewed Alex about a week ago, and he yeah. was telling us how amazing you are. Oh well, then he's gonna, he's asking for a raise, I suppose. I, mean, <laughs> I did tell no, him that I wasn't no. going to let you know, so all the hopes of a raise were out. Of, of <laughs> no, he's just look. He's a great kid. He's a great player. I love. You see, I like playing with great musicians people who are better than me in some ways you know what i mean it's like keeps you up there especially these young kids these days they're amazing you know they got so much to draw from but i mean alex is a real deal he went to the school and he did the whole bit you know and so he's he's a real nice guy to be around too they all yeah, I, I like him also i can see him because he's he's uh <laughs> height <He's your> wise <laughs> <laughs> so it's perfect yeah. i want to i want to ask you some questions i Guess I never really knew anything about you because the more I study about you, the more I'm. Well, not. how old are you? I'm not going to ask a woman that. I mean, I'm for, I'm 45. So oh, well, then you wouldn't, would you? So you. Well, young. I I so I want to ask you. You I had something I read today which I had no idea. I didn't realize that you were managed by Brian Epstein. Yeah, yeah. After we uh, we our first management. Um, you know, they were great in a way that they got us to the top of the charts, but we never saw any of the money. So eventually, because I, I, we were all friends with the Beatles in the early days, you know, we met them. I actually played with them in Birmingham I, with my band, The Diplomats, and um, we became friends. So Paul was in town. I'd go out and see people with him. We'd see a lot of American people who came over, with Hendrix and, and the Birds and people like that, Dylan. And so I was friendly with them. And then eventually they asked us, well, they asked Brian if he would manage us because he knew they knew what our situation was, you see. So um, Brian took over. But really, from that point of view, he, he was not so much a manager as he was. He had a great um, agency and we did a lot of work with his artists, you know, the NEMS agency, it was called. So it was very, very, you know, good time for us because obviously we had the Beatles on our side and we did their second British tour as well. And also I did... The Were they big at that time? Was that after Ed Sullivan and all? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Their, their second British tour, I don't know, don't ask me years because, I, you know, it's not... That's I okay, I wouldn't insult you, but... I don't, no, I don't have a memory <laughs> for stuff like that. I mean, I, you know, if I was ever to sort of have to write it down, I, you know, you'd have to... I, I don't remember certain things. There's so much going on. But, you know, around that same time, I, I had a string band, electric string band, and they Brian had theatre called the Savile Theatre, and he let me perform that on the Jimi Hendrix show, and uh, that went down really well. And all the Beatles were in the audience too. So, you know, I, I was friendly with them, and, and we all were. So um, there you go. That's how it all came about. Where do you remember seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show? No, nah, no, nah, because you, you know we were in England. We weren't oh, aware. Right, right. Of, we weren't aware of what was going on in America as much. When the Beatles <laughs> did the um, Shea Stadium, I, I was at John's house with Mike Pinder from the Moody Blues, and um, we were watching the footage from the Shea Stadium in his house. So that's you know I never really knew much of what was going on with them in America except that. I remember Julian was upstairs crying. It was a little baby. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, we we kind of saw it from England's point of view. We didn't know what was going on. Actually, we were going to be supposed to be doing the Ed Sullivan show. Um, our, vis our work permits didn't come through in time. So that, that would have done us a lot of good, actually, the Moody Blues. But it didn't. So there you go. 
But we did come to America and did the Brooklyn Fox but with Mario the K. But, you know, we never got the exposure, really, from the American scene until later on, really, is when I first started coming to America a lot. Yeah. You know, I, I also didn't realize when you talk about the electric string band, that <clears throat> was that was the style that the that ELO actually became very successful doing, right? <laughs> No comments. So you're yeah. a genius. No, <laughs> no, all Birmingham bands at that time were, you know, more or less friendly because we worked a lot together. In fact, the drummer from ELO was in my first band. Well, our band was called Denny Lane and the Diplomats, but Bev Bevan went on to join, to start ELO. But I had also done a little bit of rehearsing with some of the guys in that band before I even came down to London. Um, I knew what was going on. Roy Wood, I knew a little bit. You know, I didn't know Jeff Lynne, actually, but he came later. But I knew most of those guys. And, you know, when I came to England, to sorry, to London and started, you know, after the Mood Blues, started my own band, I wanted to do something with strings. That's all. And it was really a, a nick off what McCartney was doing with with uh, George Martin. You know, Paul had this great rapport with George and, and a lot of the, their stuff was classical. You know, they had a lot of classical and brass and arrangements. So I, I wanted to do something with two violins, two cellos. And that's what I did on the Jimi Hendrix show. Even Jimi Hendrix complimented me, believe it or not, because I was doing something a little bit, you know, out there. But, but at the same time, it had been done before. It's not like I was the first. But I think I was the first to have it live, if you like, as a live band. I was the first person to use pickups on violins and cellos. I know that. So that's really what it all was. But we're all part of a big pool of people that all knew each other. You know, you got to remember that. We stole off each other left and right, and that's what it was. But but uh, we tried to be as different as you possibly can, you know, tried to do your own thing. How How much did you have to rehearse? I know that when... I was uh, learning about when the Beatles were with the quarry, were the quarry men and stuff. They used mm. to play like at every single day at clubs. Did you guys yeah. do that as well? Well, yeah, especially, I mean, the Moody Blues didn't rehearse that much, but, you know, we had to put a set together and we did all the blues clubs in Birmingham. We weren't, I, the point is, when I joined the Moody Blues, I didn't want to play the, all the hits, you know, everybody else is doing, because you don't get anywhere doing that. It just gets you a bit of money, you know. So I said, if you do blues music, that's I'll join. So we did. We were going to go to Germany, but they, they'd just come back from Germany, two of the guys. And the Beatles were out there and all that stuff. And there was work there. But in Birmingham, there wasn't a lot of work for, like, a blues band. I think the Spencer Davis Group was the only other band that, you know, I knew those people, and they were great. And and so we were the other sort of blues band in Birmingham. So, I mean, we we rehearsed more, you know, we'd have a few songs, but they'd be blues. So, I mean, you'd, you'd jam your way through a lot of this stuff. You see what I mean? It wasn't like arrangements or anything like that. It was all just kind of getting into that music. And that's what got, got you good. That's what got the Beatles good in, in Germany, just that continual working all the time, you know. And that's what we did. We were... For years, even a year or two before I was officially a member of the Moody Blues, according to Wikipedia. I was, <laughs> no, you know, Wikipedia, well, no. <laughs> we know about them. So, um, yeah, and by the way, my name's not Arthur. Because no, it says that. On, it says that. Yeah, we, won't have, we won't go into that. Um, <laughs> yeah, they don't get it exactly right. But I was with the Moody's for a good year before we came to London and anywhere near doing the Chuck Berry show and then, and then having that hit, you know, go now hit. So we just worked a lot. And that's that's what got the bands tight, you know. That's how you – I mean, you didn't have to be a great musician, but you just had to put the work in and really, really, you know, tighten up and, and be good at the job, be professional. How many instruments do you play? Well, I mean, guitar is my main instrument, but I do quite a lot of writing on keyboards, um, you know, piano, keyboards, Um that's it, really. I, I can play the drums. I can play bass. I can play any any 
kind of you know get a tune out of any stringed instrument i suppose and and drums i you see when i make demos for example i i play all the instruments so i and when i joined uh, wings with paul i knew what he was like he was one of those guys who wanted who played everything as well and so we had a good you know we tried a lot of stuff in the studio that and i would get to play a lot of instruments just because it was experimental and we could afford to you know i mean the studio time was there it wasn't like the old days which is just three hour sessions which you had to get in and get out so i mean you know i had this this luxury really of being able to do that in the studio so that's how i picked up I mean, I got to play keyboards a lot more than I ever did. And, um, you know, I mean, the keyboard player in the Moody Blues was a great boogie-woogie guy. You know, he was a real good player. And then he went on to Mellotron with the Moody's later. But he was like an ace piano player. And I wasn't as good as him in that sense. But I picked up a lot off Mike Pinder. You know, he was a really good influence. He was a great guy, great ideas man. And me and him basically ran the musical side of the moody blues you know as far as like working out the arrangements and and then all the guys would come in and put their bits on you know but everybody had that freedom to to play what they wanted to play so again when i joined wings and with paul i wanted to have that freedom to be able to like okay i'll make a part up here you know and have that luxury i don't want people telling me what to play uh, but you do suggest things but you know with paul you can uh, as I say, make up your own part and you, then you feel like you've contributed more, you know. Did you ever, um, when when Paul called you or however that went down to join mm. Wings, mm. did you ever think first, like maybe that wasn't a good idea because you wanted to be, um, I guess, more original <laughs> with what you wanted to do versus yeah. that was in a band like he was? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the point is, I'd already been in Ginger Baker's thing. That had fallen through because of his health. And Ginger, I love Ginger, and I wanted to continue doing that, but he got sick. So then uh, I'd been in this little band called Balls with Trevor Burton from The Move and Alan White, who's now with Yes and has been for many years. And, you know, I'd sort of done the band thing or the experimental band thing a few times. Now I'm sitting in the office one day. Uh, I was staying in the office actually. I had a room at the back, and I was friendly with Mark Bolan at the time. And and my uh, well, the manager of Moody Blues, Tony Secunda, he was doing a deal for Mark Bolan, and I overheard all this going on. Mark came out, gave me a guitar. Says you should be out on the road again. And I was playing acoustic guitar. And he says he gave me electric guitar. He says get on the road. I said. Oh, well, you know, I'm just sitting here wondering what's going to happen, really. I'm I'm kind of waiting around. So my guys in my band, the string band, went on holiday. Uh, sorry, they went on a tour. Like, they were string players, so they went on. They were part of the National Youth Orchestra. So they were always kind of hard to get, you know. So they were on tour. I was doing nothing. Then I get the phone call, and he said, it's Paul. And I knew his voice straight away, obviously. And uh, so he said, you fancy getting a band together? And that was it. You know, it's like I don't talk to Paul much at all these days, but, you know, it's like you never forget, you know, people, who they are, what they're like and all the rest of it. But but I knew him very well and, and I knew that it would be a good thing to do. Although, you know, it's, I, I did think, well, you know, I, maybe I was thinking I should be doing my own thing, but that just sounded like a great idea at the time because, again, him being, you know, very productive, very creative and, and fun to be around, you know. And I never met Linda until I got on that plane and got up there. But she was great. The Denny Sywell was there, the drummer. He was from Ram. And so we had this little, you know, group together up there in the hills of Scotland. And we just sat there and just played everything that we knew. We all grew up on the same music. You've got to remember that, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's like we... You know, we just fell into it. It was a very, like, easy thing to do. It wasn't like work. And, uh, you know, in some ways, I, I, I didn't care whether we went on the road or not at that stage. It was just fun to get something together. Cheers. <laughs> do you prefer to be um, in the studio making music versus being on the road? No. <clears throat> no. I prefer the road much more. Um, because that's where you get your real energy, you know. You get it from the audience. 
What's the largest that. audience you ever played? Do you know? Well, I was told the Seattle Superdome at the time was the biggest, um, you know, arena that we played, and that was about eighty thousand, I think. But I mean, they've got bigger since then. I, I really don't know other than that. But it don't make any difference. You can't see past the first few rows anyway. You know, the lights. But uh, <clears throat> but anyway, we we started off doing universities. You know, where the crowd was right there, no effects, no stage lighting, none of that. We just went out to just try out the band, and and really, you know, I mean, it was a, it was a very very um, understandable situation from the audience's point of view, where they could see that we were just beginning as a band. You know, there was no critical stuff going on. There was no like photographers. We just turned up. They didn't even know we were there until we were on stage. Most of them. So anyway. That's how we got to, without the public scrutiny and whatever, that's how we got to start to, to get the band feeling like, you know, we were a road band. And so the studio obviously was, was great because we were creating, like I say. And so when you can create in the studio, that's when I love it. you got to remember in the Moody Blues, like we'd go in, we'd do two takes and that would be it, out, you know. Like Go Now was a lot really didn't take that long to record because in those days you couldn't afford to be in the studios for any amount of time really um but anyway that that's how i see it more like a road thing i'd rather be on the road and then go in the studio when you're fresh so you can you know have that energy and and get it across because you can't beat an, an audience you know you play better when you're in front of an audience you know Did when you, you get ever... all the nervous stuff you know did you ever feel like um, because Paul had come from the Beatles and that pretty much took over the world, did you ever feel like you had, it was almost harder to prove yourselves? Like you weren't really going right into a built-in audience because you were yeah. starting. Well, yeah, the, the, but, you know, that that didn't bother me, but I'm sure it was like from Paul's point of view, a very, very, you know, risky thing to do, but then he, he had a lot of guts too, you know, he didn't care really. He just thought, well, we'll get there and who cares what they think until we, we feel like, you know, it's good. So we just went along. You've got to remember the kind of background we've had. We Like I say, we come from that old school on the road stuff, you know, so we don't really care. You just go out and do it, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's, I mean, some people look at Dylan, you know, he goes out with a band and everybody boos him, but he didn't care. <laughs> it's, like, it's the same thing you, you just go out and you, you say well we know it's going to be good eventually but look if you've been in a band from liverpool or birmingham and you all from the same town and you've been friends for years and then all of a sudden you're thrown into the public eye i mean it's like what do you do what do you come up with next once you made one album you know that's there's your set there's your stage set. so you've got to come up with a whole new thing you know and that's not easy to do because Again, you've got that pressure from record labels. Well, a lot of people do, you know. you got to put a single out. you got to do this. I've always avoided that. I've always sort of not, you know, accepted that kind of pressure. Because if you listen to them, you'll never get anywhere. So you got to do your own thing. I think that's what happened with the Moody Blues, too. I've watched a lot of their, you know, Justin and John doing interviews. I love those guys. They're great. And they, you know, they did their own thing because they had to. So, I mean, that's what Justin says in all his interviews. He says, well, we got thrust out there and we weren't going down well with the old set. So we decided to write our own material and that's how they got big. So I think the Beatles kind of help, helped everyone with that as well because they, they were writing their own stuff. So it encouraged everybody. I mean, the Beatles had such a, you know, a big role in the music business, as you know, but amongst musicians too not just the, the the fans you know everybody kind of loved loved the beatles for what they were and what they were doing for everybody else and that was one of the things you wrote your own songs but but they gave you the confidence to i think you know because well, I mean, yeah sorry go when on. you when you did go now you were a kid i mean yeah. you, were, you weren't even 20 years old right right so well, who, who protected you guys back then i mean <laughs> They didn't. I mean, look, we had a yeah. great management, like I say, but in those days, it was like the Wild West, there was no rules. You know, nobody knew anything, and it was all experimental, and that included the money side of things. 
that you know you didn't know who your friends were you couldn't trust anybody uh, but but we had a fairly good manager in Tony Secunda who was a great marketing guy and he, you know I kind of worked with him a lot to to make the Moody's you know go up the, the ladder um, because of his ideas we 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 kind of cooperated a lot together and it wasn't just the music but basically he loved us as a band and he knew that we were slightly different to the Beatles because we had a piano, we had extra singers. Ray Thomas was a great singer, but he ended up being a back a lot of backup stuff we had that the Beatles didn't have, and then we had the harmonic and the flute and all that. So we had our own sound. So that was much more of a, uh, interesting to Sony Secunda and those guys, well, the company, that managed us. And they were very good at that. But they we didn't see the money because I... You know, I don't know really what happened with with the money, but it's just that when you're out there, you got to realize you're spending as much money as you're making. You, you know what I mean? Just to, what I'm saying about promotion and things like that. And so you can't really blame everybody at the time. You, you know, we're all kids, like you say, um, and we just we just wanted to make it. You know, we didn't want to think about what was going on in the back room, but uh, you know, obviously we just that's the whole point. If you if you're in this business, just a word of advice to people. If you're in this business, and you do you know get ripped off, a lot of people did, by the way. Don't forget that, including the Beatles. Don't forget that, right from the beginning, by various outside people who wanted to be involved with them. You know, like so we won't go into any names, but I'm just saying there were a lot of people that ripped them off, and and same with us. Same with you. You name it. Everybody's got a story about. Um, but it didn't stop us going on. So that's what's the thing where people say to me, well, what, what keeps you up there? I say, well, you just, you know, you live the thing. You can't let money be the the, the, um, the motivator. You, you, it's got to be the music. And if, you, if that's all you want to do with your life is play music, then you're going to get back up there again. So that's where the confidence comes from is what you actually, how you started out. You know, and then it so keeps you, you there. You didn't ever, you didn't ever get into this business to be rich and famous. You just wanted to play music. Well, I'm, I want to be rich and famous. I'm not, <laughs> as Arthur said, I'm not stupid. I took the money. <laughs> but yeah, it, it has to be. You have to have money to be able to do it. Like I say, if you can't. Have, if you don't have success, then you don't get the open-ended studio time. You don't get you know, the promotion, you don't get the good gear, it's all that. So you have to spend money to, to make money. It's the same in any business, you know. You, you want to be as near as the luxury level as you can possibly be because that's what you have to do. I mean, you know, you can't fly coach when you're doing a tour, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? You've got to have the private plane. You've got to have the whole bit or the, the roadies and the equipment and whatever. So you've got to make money. You've got to be, and it, if you're going to be successful, you got to, you want to be as famous as you possibly can because that's all part of success. But I don't like the fame as much as I, or the money as much as I like the music. Let's put it that way. Um, I wouldn't do. I try not to do anything for money if 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 that's the the guiding thing. I have done. Don't get me wrong. Oh, come and do this and sit in with us and we'll get you this. And I say, okay, then well, pay my expenses and I'll do it. But, you know, I, I like to try try and sort of keep down, like more of an artistic point of view, I like to keep away from all that fame and whatever because I, I think that's caused a lot of problems with a lot of people, you know, it goes to their heads a little bit. I think it hurts the industry overall. It does. It does. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, like people at the like record labels and people like you know they never really were that into mu the the rock world to start with, but it got better you know people like Clive Davis and you know and uh, Chris Blackwell at Ryland Records they all became like part of the whole thing and they they really like did help because they they were great lovers of music and they were. They believed in, you know, Peter Grant, Led Zeppelin. They believed in the artists. Tony Secunda with the Moody Blues. They believed the artists. So it wasn't just about trying to rip you off, you know what I'm saying. They, they, and if you were working with those kind of guys, they all learned at the same time as you did. And they were, you couldn't do it without them. 
I mean, there's no way you couldn't do it without these people who, who who went up the same ladder as you did, you know, at the same time. But we're all learning at the same time, too. But, you know, all of my friends, most of my friends now are all successful, you know, because they all started and had the same attitude, you know. I mean, we knew everybody in the early days. You're kidding me, aren't you? I mean, the clubs in London... You know, we'd be sitting there, the Who would be next door, or the Beatles over there, the Stones over there. I used to knock around with them, all those people and, and have fun and go and see American artists, you know, stuff that came into London. It's, so it's it was a great little scene. It really I've been watching, there's a show, uh, a documentary on Laurel Canyon where it, it's... Oh, yeah. That's what it... I saw that. Your area, it sounds like that was like the English version of what we were doing in America. Yeah. Everybody was just yeah. hanging out. It was, well, yeah, minus the uh, topless, you know, L.A. women. <laughs> um, minus, the, minus all the drugs and minus all the, the craziness that went on there. I mean, come on. I mean, L.A. I mean, nobody wears any clothes because it's so hot. I mean, you know, that's not what we were. We were like, you know, wrapped up like we're woolly polar neck sweaters and, you know, freezing our asses off, just staying in because you couldn't go out. You know what I mean? So a lot of our music came because we didn't have an outdoor crazy. Well, it's not so crazy. I mean, I knew a lot of those guys. David David Crosby, I knew him years ago. When he, a lot of them came to England. But they were all came from Laurel Canyon. They were all part of that scene. Um, and I knew a few of those people uh, later on, you know. But but it, it wasn't like that for us. We, we were just from like a, a working town, you know, a factory town. And we all had that. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons you would stay in because there's nothing to do. You stay in and then I used to sit on the stairs practicing the guitar, you know, and, and listening to records or whatever. My sisters had a lot of great records and there was a lot of music in the house from that point of view. So I was just like a little kid, you know, that was my hobby, really. Something to do instead of going out in the street and getting beat up by all the locals. You know, there's a lot of a lot of fights going on in those days. People. What you know. did your family think about the fact that you were in? It was right after the war, wasn't it? When yeah, yeah. when you said like, I don't want to get that type of a job, a factory job. I want to be a musician. What what was their feelings? Well, they didn't care. They did that. Well, they did care in the sense that they let me do what I wanted to do. Because you got to remember, I'm from like a five five kid family, and I was the youngest. So and my oh, by the time they just want you to breathe. <laughs> well, exactly, they were more like you know grandparents. Oh, let him do what he wants to do, and you know it's too much work for us. To, but but it, in a good way, you know, they let me do it, and and my dad really kind of. Well, I mean, all my sisters went to dance school. I went to a, a pantomime school myself. It start, that's how I started playing music was on stage in, in the interval between the pantomime, you know. And, and then, wow. uh, yeah, so it was kind of like that, that where, you know, I was in a, my sisters, like I say, one of them was a professional dancer. And, and really? they, yeah, they all went to this same Jackie Cooper school of dancing and I went there. But I wasn't really so much of a dancer, but I was in the, you know, in the cast, if you like. And um, so I learned a lot of that from stage stuff from that. And then the music thing, as I say, I used to play guitar in between. He played piano and I played guitar, the guy, Jackie Cooper, in the, in the, in the breaks. You know, everybody's going for a drink, like, and we'd be on there playing. So, I mean, I got into it that way. And then I... Well, I, I as a, as a kid, I got to um, <clears throat> I got to the finals in some. I didn't go; it wasn't my idea. But I got put into some contests, and I got to, the, and then I wouldn't go for the finals just in case I lost. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I was in the finals, and then when I was twelve, I played in front of this big audience at this big place in Birmingham called the. Uh, uh, the Birmingham Institute, you know, it's like that as a kid. And then I kind of grew up that way without even thinking about being in a band. <clears throat> so, you know, it's, it's all right. I'm just, I've been in the pool. <clears throat> I, I should I'm, be doing. I, should, I, I don't know anybody from England that goes in the sun. So I'm, that's just incredible. <clears throat> don't go in the sun. Hey. You have I, to go in the sun a little bit. Yeah, but I'm not a sunbather. I'm not, not one of them types. 
Yeah, I you know, I used to, um, my parents took us to see the Moody Blues mm. many, 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 many times. And the one thing that it seems as though they, I mean, my opinion, it seemed like when they got into some of the um, later stuff, like Seesaw and stuff, they had that electric sound that yeah. you originally wanted to do with your group. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it's a long story, but I'll try and keep it short. Mike Pender, the keyboard player, every time the Moody's would go and do a gig, the piano would be out of tune. You know, there'd be a, the piano at the hall. And they'd be out of tune. And, and sometimes be, they'd be waiting an hour while a tuner would come and tune the piano. So, you know, that didn't go down too well with the crowd. So when I left, Mike Pinder went on to Mellotron. And Mellotron is a machine. I mean, a lot of people know Mellotrons now. It's just a machine that used to have tapes and you press the keyboard and, and then it would play whatever's on that tape. They would have one in every major studio. It would, they'd use them for sound effects, whatever, you know. EMI had one, Decca had one. And Mike Pinder used to work at Mellotrons because it was a company that came from Birmingham, our hometown, believe it or not. And so it was a natural progression for him to get into Mellotrons. But he also worked with Roland Corporation, which was a big electronics, you know, music electronic group, to build the first synthesizers as well. So they were kind of, you know, all part of that. And that, that led to samples and, and, uh, and, and everything else. So, you know, instead of, but the Mellotron was smaller. The, the one that they had was too big. And then they had a smaller one built and then they could take that on the road. Although they would still have problems with it. Don't get me wrong, because it was early days, you know. Um, it was a lot easier than going out with a piano. So that's what le led to the electronic if you like. I mean, the, the music that on Days of Future Past was not all orchestra. The mood is actually played, well, Mike Pinder played those strings on a Mellotron, recorded strings on a Mellotron, in Nights in White Satin, for example, da -da 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 -da, was all that. And and it wasn't, you know, the orchestra only played in between the, the band. You get what I mean? So, Absolutely. So that's, the mood is... Like I say, I, people say to me, oh, they went in a completely different direction. But they actually didn't. It's just the Mellotron made a big difference. And obviously, you know, Justin John's songs were, were different. They were writing their own, doing their own songs, you know. Whereas I wasn't really with the Moody Blues. I was doing more sort of blues classics, you know. Uh, so they they that took them in a different direction. But the actual the, the arrangements, the style the the kind of group the beat that we had the feel that we had as a band was there when i was in the band and and that made them i think that gave them that sort of extra thing that they had that background from when i was in the band and then they took that into this newer area so you know and, and i'm really a big fan of the moody's because of the fact that they did that they had the guts to do that you know um, you, so. you actually, both the bands that you're known for, both did things that were just different. I mean, yeah. that's <clears throat> a pretty incredible thing right there. Well, again, you had to be competitive. You know, you, you, you a lot of people were great copiers, you know, I mean, like they'd be like into some artist and know some old blues artist or whatever and they'd be like every note for note be and a lot of people were good copiers you had to be in some ways to get the work in the, in the early days it's that's like tribute bands now you had to be a good tribute band you know when you're young to get the work because they only wanted to hear the hits but that took me from i wasn't a great copier but it took me from that into kind of using all those different influences to do my own thing. And, and my, my influences, like I say, came from a lot of, you know, 40s, 20s music, uh, you know, old blueses, old old jazz people. Uh, Django Reinhardt was a big influence on me, uh, Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, I wasn't just, you know, a pop person. Folk music was big with me too, and country music. I was very into that. Bluegrass especially. So, I mean, I had all these different influences. And also, you know, my parents, we had a piano in the house. 
loved people like Charlie Coons and Winifred Atwell, and these are pianists, you know, like like Liberace would be over here. That's where our version of that. So they had all that music, and then there was always classical music too. So I was I was listening to all that stuff. So I put that into everything I was doing because I just wanted to be different, you know. As I can say, that's what the Moody's were. They were different. They had a different sound. Nobody sounded like them, you know. You have a different love for the Moody Blues than you do for Wings? Well, in a way, because that was when I first kind of made it. You know, it was like, you know, when you're, when you're all from the same town and you, and you go up the ladder together, you really do enjoy that... that um, you know, camaraderie comes from, like I say, being in the same, you know, band for years on end. You're always working. You're always together. Um, and, and you know, so we got to number one on the Chuck Berry tour. You know, that's where I first met Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce because they were on that same tour. And so, yeah, it's a, it, was, it was different for us. But when, with Wings, it wasn't like that at all. It was, I was kind of second in command with Paul. But it was, you know, it was more, he was so famous. I mean, what else could you do? It was, he was, he couldn't help be Paul McCartney, you know, that's it. So, and I had some fame, but it really was, you know, it was more his ideas than mine. And I was kind of like a bit of a, a younger brother kind of thing. Um, but you also, you played with George Harrison also, right? Well, yeah. I mean, George was a friend of mine. He used to go around to his house a lot because uh, he lived up the road from the Moody Blues. But I didn't really play with him a lot. We did. Did he lent me a guitar once? I kept it for a year, and, and then he. But um, you know, what kind I never of guitar? Really, uh, Rickenbacker. Oh. But, but he, he, you know, he was a friend more than he was. I wasn't working with George. I did that one thing. I forget what it was called now. I actually, I, I wrote it down. That's why I was asking you about it, because I was really surprised to read. Um, that, was a, that was Paul, me and Paul and Linda. But we, we all were, those, we, um, it was all those years gone. That's right, yeah, all those years ago or something like that. But you also <laughs> play, you play with Robert Plant also, right? Well, I've been on the same bill as Robert. You know what I mean? Like I say, these are all people like John Bonham from Zeppelin was my friend. He, well, he was as a kid. He used to come and see us. He used to come and see us, and he loved uh, Bevan's drumming. And he used to come and see us as a kid. And so, I mean, he, when they were in town, they'd come over to my house or where he would, and um, you know, so I knew a lot of these people. That they, they were just kind of friends, but not. I never really played with them. You get what I mean? It was never, never really on that scene where everybody, except if you were maybe at a party or something, you might get up and do something like that. But we actually did. Actually, John Bonham did play drums on one of our tracks in the studio. Come to think of it, um, "Beware My Love" it was called. We had a version of it with him on drums. But other than that, we didn't really work outside of the band. You know. When's the last time? You saw a musician play that you were like, oh, my God, that person is incredible. Well, yeah. well, you know, I mean, the thing is, my my thing is that I've met so many of those people. Um, Stevie Wonder, I would say, was one of the people that I, that I really would put in that category, you know, and. He liked me and I liked him and we, we got on really well together in the studio and whatever. Um, so, I mean, that would be the kind of person. I mean, I always liked Steve Winwood as well. He, he always blew me away because he was so dedicated and so great. But, but you know, I like musicians who sing, let's put it that way, or songwriters, you know, write their own stuff. So anybody like that, I would say would be who I'm attracted to more than just, you know, well, as I say, I like writers. Buddy Holly was a big influence on everybody because he wrote his own songs and played guitar and sang them. Um, so, I mean, I'd say Stevie, as far as like musically, would be maybe up there at the top, you know, but uh, I've seen a lot of guys like that. What do, do you, I know that you don't have favourites, but... If what do you think in your in your heart is the best song that has ever been written? 
<laughs> God. Well, that's a, 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 a I don't know. Give me one of them. Uh, Amazing Grace. I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of, I, lo I used to love a lot of old, um, you know, well, I grew up in the church, you know, like everybody. Um, my mother was a big church girl. Um, and I was also, I was into gospel a lot. Um, I love gospel music. Elvis was obviously, you know, the biggest influence on everybody because he lived and worked around all the black artists, or you know, the, that society that he lived in. He 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 bought two pieces of music and put them together, and it, was, it ended up being called rock and roll because he was he again was an innovator. You know, he had he had the guts to do that. Um, but again, I don't think it was a con think with him i think it just came because he lived in that neighborhood he was influenced a lot of his friends were all like you know black kids and they he loved that music same with me i whatever my background was is what i i was you know attracted to but again most mostly it was church music a lot of it was you know and folk music <clears throat> i mean folk music came because there was a lot of folk artists in England. I, I, actually, when I put the string band together, I was part of that whole um, um, "Say It Out Minds" the song I had, and it was it was all um, it was all jazz people and sorry folk music on that record, you know, except for Viv Prince, who was the drummer from the Pretty Things, but it was all uh, that, and and I was part of the folk scene. The, the string band was like part of the folk scene really in London and I would go out like and play places like with uh, I don't know Bert Yanks and uh, you know those kind of guys that uh, Donovan was a big friend of mine at the time actually he did the first fle sleeve notes for um, the Moody Blues album but people like Donovan were part of that scene and I was part of that scene and then there was of course Jimmy Page and, and John Bonham um, sorry, and, and John Paul Jones, who were session guys at the time, so I knew all them people. Um, yeah, so I, I mixed with a lot of different, you know, artists who could, who were into all different styles of music. Let's put it that I, I just liked people who had a broad outlook on music. You know, I, I can't stand people who say, "Oh, I hate country music, but I love this." You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know, all music, as long as it's good, is yeah. So that's really it. Yeah. Now the Moody Blues, um, they're the new box set that <clears throat> Moody Blues have. Um, there's more of your music on that, right? Yeah, there's more of my. I wrote a lot of songs, and Mike Pinder kind of helped me finish them off. Is uh, that the Magnificent Moody's? Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, a lot of others singles that we did i mean we did singles we did eps which was extended plays in those days um we did a few well well that box set has got like uh, 30 odd tracks on it or something so really? it just shows you yeah so it just shows some some outtakes and some whatevers and some a couple of tim hardin songs I, he was a big influence on me tim hardin he was a great folk singer and writer uh if i were a carpenter you know reason to believe a lot of his stuff. We even did a cover of um, How Can We Hang On To A Dream with the Moody Blues. So these folk people were, were a big influence on me. That's that's really where I'm coming from, yeah. Once all of this is over, you plan on going back on tour again with your band, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've I start, well, I've started to enjoy doing this solo thing because that, again, came about as, you know, my band members being... Well, either working with the monkeys like Alex or, or working with Cat Power like my bass player or doing his own thing like Brian Pothier in his studio. And, you know, and Ben was in Alex's band. So they're all doing their own thing too. So they weren't always available. So as a result of that, I started to do solo stuff. And that was going down really well. I enjoyed it because I could just do what I wanted to do. Yeah, it wasn't as restricting as a band you get me hang on i'm falling off the chair here yeah. um, so you're going to do more of those after yeah yeah that's the problem you know, what well what i really like is that you're not a, you don't ever consider yourself a tribute band because you put your own spin on music yeah 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 i don't like i don't look 
I, I wouldn't want to go out there and try and sound like Wings or the Moody Blues. It's ridiculous to me because I'm not in those bands anymore. And I'll leave that to the tribute bands, which is great. But I'm not that at all. I, I, I do those songs, but I do my versions of them, you know, my modern versions. And obviously they've still got elements of those arrangements in there, obviously. But, you know, when you've got a great guitar player or a great keyboard player or a great drummer or bass player, you let them do more stuff. So you add them to it. Like, like we were doing the Band on the Run album at one time as part of the show. Um, because it went down well and we, and we kept doing it. And all the guys were singing the songs, not not just me. So you couldn't possibly be a, a tribute band that does, you know. But but again, that's never been my thing. I think that's kind of, you know, yeah, that's kind of would be an easy route, really, to do that. Oh, but I, I don't think that's do wonderful that. that you don't. Now, and, and the solo show, what would be the difference if I was to come see your solo show um, what what do you do with that? Do you tell stories and things? Well, yeah, I suppose, yeah. Well, it's it's mainly stories about how the songs are written, you know. Or I mean, there's always some kind of story behind everything, right? And and you you kind of lead up to doing the song, and when they know more about the song, I wrote this song called "Below the Waterline," and it's about me and Paul, in a way. It's like What's it like, you know, below the waterline? Everybody sees it from the above, you know, but below the waterline is where the real, the truth is. So I tell that little story, and of course, because they know what it's about, they applaud it, and yet it's never been on record before. They've never heard it. So, you know, that's the kind of thing I enjoy doing, whereby, you know, I'm not going to go out there and do all the Wings hits. I mean, that's ridiculous. I'd do some of them. But but it's not what I'm all about. I'm I'm all about going out there and doing stuff of my own, which I've I've had like, six or seven solo albums out, you know, um, and I just do a mixture. And I, at the time, it depends. Somebody might shout out a song from the audience, and I can do it. But you can't do that with the band so much. You, you're restricted with bands, and uh, of course, you can't spend all night telling stories with the band either. But it, people like that. I think it's more sort of an intimate setting. And, the interaction uh, is, yeah, is yeah. great. And it also reminds us of our childhood, you know. Exactly, yeah. It takes people That's back, important. doesn't it? Yeah, I, yeah. Before I let you go, I want to ask you, when um, I watched you at, accept um, at the uh, Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, <laughs> were you nervous at all being on that stage? Nah. No, no, I just didn't. I just want. They asked me if I wanted to make a speech, and I said, "No, nah, I don't be doing that," because you know it's like I was. I <laughs> it just came off the top of my head. I said, "Well, I wasn't in the band that long, so I won't talk too long." But <laughs> but you know, it was all about really like being proud of something that I was a part of, and and I also had to say that I really liked what they were doing. Now you know, I was, I was like a a fan of what they do so really that's what it was and 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 of course we just lost ray thomas he he passed away before then uh, but a lot of those people his wife turned up and a lot of those going to the hall of fame was more like you know catching up with everybody if you see what i mean i mean i knew all those i knew stevie van zandt i met john bon jovi although i'd met his band before i met a lot of people i knew you know, so I mean, it was more like a, a gathering, really, more than anything else. It was great to see Mike Pinder again. I hadn't seen him for years, and Graham, uh, although he didn't talk to me much. But it, it's just like it's like you, you know these people so well, you don't have to talk. But Justin, and John were great into me. You know, it's like a it was a good feeling. Um, but the the Hall of Fame, you got to remember the reason they got into the Hall of Fame was because of Go Now. You know that, don't you? I mean, you can't you can't get in unless you've had a number one. So I always thought Night and White Satin was a number one, but apparently it wasn't. But, See, um, they needed you. So well, they did. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, listen, I'm at last. <laughs> you are just you're unbelievable. Your fans, I they just keep telling me how much you're so sweet and so wonderful you just making people they don't know me obviously well you know that's for the tell-all you know that 
That's that that's where Liz is going to collect all her money one day. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> Denny, I'm I'm so honored to talk to you. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. I'm just trying to keep everybody with something to do until the world oh, yeah. opens, you know? Well, I love everybody's doing that. I saw a thing with Rod Stewart. Apparently, he's moved to Florida as well. He did one with his daughter, which was great. Everybody's doing it, and there's nothing wrong with that. And well, everybody's think, moving like, to Florida. <laughs> yeah, why not? Nice I love it. Time. I can't yeah. wait to see you when you're back on the road and on um, I look for and I know I'm talking you into doing karaoke with the fans. Oh I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the trouble is they'll just show me up there. You see what I mean? They know this stuff better than I do. <laughs> don't That's don't ever ask Paul fun. don't ever ask Paul McCartney to sing one of his old songs. You say, I can't remember it. Yeah. <laughs> He's not the only one. <laughs> you are you wonderful. So I'm going to share everybody for them to be able to check out your official pages because I, I know there's a lot of fake accounts out there and we're going to make sure Oof. that we send the fans to the correct place. Is this the real Denny Lane? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, yeah. I, the, the, a fake Mickey Dolan's account the other day I was exchanging and I said, how are you? I miss you. And he's like, I don't remember you. And he asked me for money. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You're going to be so careful, you know. Denny, I can't you help are. But be sarcastic. You're amazing. I can't help but be sarcastic with them people, but never mind. Go. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to. Uh, it's difficult yeah. this day and age, but it is. Steer everybody to the right um, place so that when you are back in the swing of things, people can go and sell out your shows. And you're just wonderful. Thank you so much. And Liz, thank you so much. I wish she's not here at the moment, but yeah. Make sure you get her. <laughs> All right, Jody, it's great. And you're the best. Thank Enjoyed you so it. much. Stay safe. You too. Take care of yourself. Bye. There you go. Denny Lane. How about that? Two of the most incredible bands of all time. And me and Lansdale got to hang out with him tonight. So anyway, that was amazing. I hope you learned something. I didn't ask him, but check it out. He was actually um, knocking on, uh, he was knocking on Brian Epstein's door the day that uh, Brian Epstein didn't answer because he had passed away. I didn't want to ask him about that, but I was fascinated to find that out. Um, so anyway, I'm going to share all the official places to check out Denny. And then when he comes around, we can go and, and see him and celebrate his music. And then on Sunday, um, from England, I'm interviewing Ian Lee. If you check him out, he's a comedian. He's been on television. He's a huge Monkees fan and DJ and all that fun stuff. So check Ian Lee out. I'll be on Sunday. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned something about Denny Lane. Wow. Unbelievable. I'm so excited. We, we were called the Moody Blouse growing up. So I had no choice but to be a, a Moody Blues fan. And um, it was great to talk to him. And thank you so much, everybody. Stay safe. And I'll see you on Sunday. Bye-bye.